I've known uh, Glenn Holstein for a number of years, as we we both served on the CNPS Chapter Council uh, together. Uh, he has a long and illustrious uh, uh, bio. Uh, he uh, has a, a PhD in botany from uh, Cal Davis, uh, University of California, Davis. Uh, and he has been had a part in things that uh, uh, you may know about. He, he, he helped to found the California Natural Diversity Database, which is one of our most important repositories of, uh, of native plant and rare plant information in the state. Uh, he had a, a hand and worked for the creation of four, uh, four different reserves, including the iconic uh, Carrizo Plain. Uh, he had a, a long career as a botanical consultant, and in retirement, he's continued to be active in a number of conservation projects, including the uh, uh, recent successful effort to protect Walker Ridge. Uh, he, uh, back in 2011, he was the co-editor of a special issue of Vermontia, now Artemisia, uh, on California prairies and grasslands, and uh, actually wrote three uh, articles for that uh, for that special issue of the journal. And uh, it's uh, not fortuitous that uh, he's going to be talking basically on the same subject tonight on California prairies, our least appreciated major ecosystems. Uh, so uh, thank you and. Uh, like to turn it over to Glenn. Hey. Well, welcome, folks. I know you're all. Uh, somewhat familiar with John Muir, but uh, one of the things that is uh, most significant about John Muir is that uh, more than anyone else, he uh, created really the idea that uh, nature wasn't just something to be used, but it was something to be protected for its own sake. And uh, as a result, the idea spread around the world and is really the primary origin of national parks, preserves, that are, are found in just about every country now on earth uh, to uh, move towards that protection of 30% uh, of nature by the year 2030. But in uh, 1868, John Muir uh, arrived in California, uh, walked down the coast range from San Francisco, uh, from Pacheco Pass, then he walked eastward towards the Sierra Nevada at a time when the uh, San Joaquin Valley was not uh, irrigated farmland like it is today. It was a pretty wild place. It had pronghorns, hip foxes, spadefoots, kangaroo rats, and kangaroo rats are something really special for California. We're the world center of uh, diversity of kangaroo rats and uh, a lot of those species are in the uh, general area that uh, Muir walked across to get to the Sierra Nevada. And prairie falcons specifically for the open areas of California, uh, not nearly so associated with uh, uh, wetlands as uh, peregrine falcons, uh, mountain plovers, uh, unlike a lot of uh, plovers, this one's not so much a wetland species as it likes the open areas that were uh, near found in the uh, Central Valley before it was largely irrigated. When he described this uh, walk across the valley in the spring of 1868 as having uh, what he called bee pastures, flowers, uh, for miles in every direction. Uh, and so it was a pretty wild place. 
And he said one of the things that struck him the most was it wasn't so much flowers amid the grass, but grass amid the flowers. Before he came to California, he had walked a thousand miles from Wisconsin down to the Gulf of Mexico. And he found California a very different place than the Eastern United States that he'd already walked through. Uh, flowers were there, but uh, he'd never seen fields of flowers that went on and on for miles as far as he could see till he saw the San Joaquin Valley uh, before it was farmland. But you can still see uh, the same kind of landscape that uh, Muir saw in the San Joaquin Valley in 1868 in uh, Carriza Plains, uh, very similar ecologically uh, and uh, an area now that is uh, protected for that kind of landscape that is mostly gone in the San Joaquin Valley, but still survives in some of the other valleys, particularly the one in Carriza Plain. But the actual description of California's vegetation and vegetation in North America was not so much uh, a product of uh, John Muir. He was the one that led conservation of nature, but Frederick Clements was really the uh, academic uh, guru for vegetation science in the early part of the 20th century. And uh, he had a huge influence on how we think about California and specifically about the open areas of California. And he had certain rules in his uh, studies of vegetation. One is that annuals aren't vegetation. And of course, that's significant because the plants that went on for miles, the bee pastures that Muir talked about were annuals, uh, that vegetation converges to a climatic climax. And that California's open areas are in the same climax as the Midwest and see if you can get this and they are dominated by perennial bunch grasses uh, naturally. But there are problems with this because if everything in the world of vegetation uh, is driven by climate, uh, it turns out that climate is one of the least stable things around. The few glaciers that we have that are starting to melt now actually were not left over from the ice age, but all the ice melted in the Sierra Nevada in a warm spell after the ice age. And they had to uh, reform, at least in a small way, during what's called the little ice age that really went on until the 1800s. And that means we have uh, old growth forests in which the trees uh, extend back in age into this little ice age, very, uh, a climate very different than the one we have today. So the idea that uh, climate is the most significant thing that drives vegetation is, doesn't work too well in many cases. And then one of the things that's most uh, dynamic and significant, and is very obvious here in California, is geology. Geology tends to be a lot more permanent than climate. And here, when you can see on one side of Cache Creek in the background, uh, the kind of vegetation you get on serpentine and that's very different from the foreground vegetation that's on uh, Great Valley sediments. And so uh, it's vegetation here that pretty clearly is being driven by geology more than just climate because the climate's the same there, but the vegetation is very different and the geology is very different. But you can kind of see where uh, Clements got this idea. If you uh, look at the forests of the east, they're fairly similar all the way from uh, Canada down to Florida. Uh, eastern deciduous forests are, there's a, some variation, but there's also a lot in common there. And uh, the landscape looks fairly similar uh, throughout a pretty wide area. And if you look at the uh, climatic conditions in that forest, in these uh, climate diagrams, this is the growing season. This is uh, from cold winters up to the warm summers and then back through fall to the winter again. And this is the rainfall. So in New York City, the rainfall and precipitation, some snow is pretty consistent all through the year. And it's definitely present at the height of the growing season in midsummer. 
And as you go west from that eastern deciduous forest, you run into uh, tall grassland, and then mid grassland and short grassland as you go further and further west. Yeah, we've got a problem with going back. Yeah, okay. Yeah, here's the climate diagram of uh, Omaha in the, the uh, short grassland, uh, actually the transition between the tall grassland and shorter grassland, pretty tall grassland there. But uh, it's somewhat different than the pattern in New York because um, you have the same pattern of winter warmth in the summer and then cool again through the fall into winter again. But the pattern of rainfall is very different. It's low in the winter and very high in the summer, just at the time when plants need water the most when they're growing the fastest. So you have plenty of water in the growing season, but you don't have a big surplus of water in the winter to use for uh, potentially forests or to affect the soil that is suitable for forests. Well, we had uh, another important uh, ecologist in the early 20th century, W.S. Cooper. And he was very much a believer in the climatic climax theory, but he was looking for what was the climax vegetation of California, because he knew that uh, the climate, the Mediterranean climate of California was uh, very different. Uh, climates worked out of Nebraska, uh, but uh, Cooper was very, uh, very much a California worker and was looking for what was the universal vegetation that uh, fitted our Mediterranean climate here in California. And he thought it was chaparral because chaparral was the most distinctive uh, kind of vegetation that was different from the rest of the vegetation in the United States. So he believed that uh, the whole state of California was more or less, other than the high mountains, covered with chaparral, including the Central Valley. But yet, if you go into the Central Valley, uh, you find that uh, there's no record of uh, chaparral vegetation, except in a few places where some streams have carried uh, gravel and boulders into the valley. You have some uh, places where there's chaparral plants, but very few. And there's no record of the Central Valley ever being covered with chaparral, uh, like uh, Cooper uh, suggested was the historical case. That was based on theory, but it doesn't seem to fit the historical facts. Well, Clements uh, mapped the climatic climax vegetation of North America in this colored map. You see the blue here, that's the Eastern deciduous forest we talked about with uh, a climate somewhat similar to uh, New York City. And then the uh, grasslands uh, ranging from tall grass to short grass here, all extending all the way from Northern Mexico into well into Canada. This is where uh, Clements in Nebraska was uh, centered. So he was very familiar with this. And he didn't believe that uh, the uh, Central Valley was ever covered by chaparral. So he uh, gerrymandered the climatic climax of the Central Valley into the same uh, climatic climax as he had in Nebraska. And since stipa was the dominant grass in Nebraska, he concluded that stipa and one of the common stipas out here, stipa pulchra, was the dominant grass in the Central Valley. So he talked about a bunch grass climatic climax here, but then there was another climatic climax out here on the outer coast associated with a uh, forest that came all the way down from southeastern Alaska, all the way down to the redwoods, but there were open areas there and any open areas there would be in a different climatic climax. And then finally down here in the very southwestern part of California, uh, 
that would be the climatic climax in which chaparral is most dominant. So the idea that uh, uh, Stipapulcra bunchgrass was the dominant vegetation throughout Central California uh, was very significant. They, the view was based on what Clements had taught uh, that originally the vegetation was like this, all Stipapulcra uh, throughout the entire center of California. And because of those teachings, uh, growing Stipapulcra to restore that theoretical original vegetation of that climatic climax in the Central Valley of California became at one point a very important restoration business. There were whole farms that grew Stipapulcra so it could be planted to restore the Central Valley as it once was, as Clemens told us. In fact, it was even used to restore the natural vegetation to the front of the Davis Post Office here. So it showed up a lot of places. Well, Art Shapiro is uh, one of the world's number one uh, lepidopterists. And he was uh, skeptical about this idea. He says, when you look at the butterfly fauna, which he was an expert in, uh, he found that uh, the butterfly fauna uh, in the Central Valley was not associated with, with uh, what he would consider a uh, bunch grass vegetation. It was very different and was associated more with uh, vegetation dominated by flowers, very much like uh, John Muir described. So like our little uh, Malvella here, a native, uh, we didn't have the vegetation, at least according to Art Shapiro, that uh, we would have expected based on uh, Clement's conclusions. So maybe that uh, description that uh, John Muir gave of flowers, as far as you can see, that went on for miles, was maybe not so wrong after all. And maybe it wasn't all bunch grass that covered the valleys, like in this case, Carissa Plains, but this is very much the way he described, uh, Muir described uh, the San Joaquin Valley as he walked across it in 1868. But most of us learn vegetation from the vegetation section in uh, California flora, at least, uh, at least us older botanists. And uh, that uh, vegetation uh, description was very much based on Clement's map of uh, climatic climax vegetation for California. So it talked about in the area where you had uh, forest vegetation extending down the coast, open areas there, were what uh, that book described as coastal prairie. And then further inland, uh, the book described it as uh, uh, valley grassland. And that valley grassland was the area that was grassland because Clements told us it was covered by Stipopulchra. And today it's primarily covered uh, by non-native annual grasslands. Uh, non-native annual grass species. So it's a grassland in, uh, in both cases, from uh, the introduced plants that cover it today and the native plants that Clements postulated were the original dominance. And so whenever you look at it, it's called a valley grassland because it's covered with grass, but most of these grasses are not native grasses, very few are native grasses. But if you look at the actual grasses themselves, like Stipopocra, the uh, separation between Stipopocra in the Sacramento Valley and Stipopocra on the coast suggests that it's just as abundant in these records uh, on the coast in what's called coastal prairie as it is in uh, valley grassland here in the Central Valley. In fact, in a big part of the Central Valley, way, way down here in the San Joaquin Valley, it's never been recorded at all in history. A much more widespread uh, grass in the Central Valley, native grass, is creeping wild rye or Alamus triticoides. But once again, 
it's not just in the Central Valley and the Valley grassland, it's also out here in what we call coastal prairie. So the idea that there's a separate coastal prairie and a valley grassland, I think is more derived from a Clements map of uh, that uh, kind of gerrymandered this into the same kind of vegetation as Nebraska than on reality since the two commonest grasses are both in the valley grassland and the coastal prairie. And of course, uh, John Muir talked about uh, not uh, flowers amid the grass, but uh, grass amid the flowers. In other words, there was some small grass that was obviously uh, not big bunch grass or, or tall creeping wild rye that was out there in those uh, uh, fields of flowers, but there had to be something very small. And probably the best example, that most likely example of a rare native grass, uh, not really rare so much, but uh, rare, uh, not so obviously seen is this little annual grass, Wilpia microstachys. But once again, it's out in the coastal prairie, it's in the Central Valley, it's in Southern California, and it even gets into the desert to a degree as well, especially the Modoc Plateau. Well, to call the valley grassland uh, a grassland because it's dominated by non-native uh, species is uh, not something they do down in Chile. They uh, have an awful lot of the wetter part of Chile covered with non-native brooms, but they don't call it a broom vegetation. They refer to it as the original vegetation, which they know from historical records, which was uh, Nothophagus forest with some uh, quite a bit of uh, diversity like this cranodendron tree with beautiful red flowers. This is what they think of as their real vegetation, not the many areas of disturbance that are now dominated by non-native brooms. So in a sense, we're kind of calling our valley grassland something uh, based on something that's not the uh, historical do uh, dominated vegetation, but an introduced non-native vegetation, kind of like the brooms down in Southern Chile. Well, if you actually look at the, uh, a lot of the vegetation in California, you really see a mosaic where you get uh, oak woodland and open areas with grass, chaparral, lots of things, all within the same climatic zone. These are all so close together that the climate isn't significantly different, but you have a, a real mosaic of vegetation to a great degree dependent on more the geology and the soils than the climate. Because here, the, it's a small enough area, the climate's pretty much the same. You get that same situation, very widespread, this mosaic of vegetation, not a climax, uh, with a single kind of vegetation all over the place, but areas of chaparral, areas uh, dominated by grass, areas dominated by oaks, all within the same climatic zone. And if you look at the climate diagram of our Mediterranean climate, you see something very, very different than those uh, uh, grasslands in the central part of the United States and the forest in the eastern part of the United States, where you had rainfall peaking in midsummer when plants grow the fastest. Here you have rainfall peaking in the cold season where plants uh, tend to grow the slowest. So you've got rainfall here, a need for water here when it's not raining. Uh, you get a little bit of a crossover here. That's one reason we have such spectacular spring vegetation but it's very important for this uh, water in the winter to be present uh, during the growing season. And it's largely uh, geological conditions, the kind of rocks, the kind of soil that determine how much and where that uh, water from the winter is held so it's available during the growing season. Completely opposite from the uh, grassland climate in Nebraska, even though in Clement's climax map, these two were lumped together 
as having the same climatic climax like what he experienced in his home in Nebraska. Very, very different kinds of climates. And a good example of this is uh, May in the uh, Coast Range. Now here you notice the grass is all brown, but it's the understory in Oak Woodland. Within the same climate, as you go into the hills, all of a sudden the trees drop out except in ravines, and the grass is no longer brown, it's still bright green. How could that be? Within the same climate, brown grass here, green grass here. Well, the explanation is that great importance of how that water from the winter is sequestered so that plants during the growing season can utilize it. Down here, we're on the Sonoma Volcanics, deeply fractured rock where the water doesn't stay at the surface very much. It goes down into cracks where it can feed the deep roots of the oak trees. But because it doesn't stay at the surface for very long, the grass, even when the oaks are flourishing, is all brown by May. Over here in this Eocene sedimentary uh, area in these hills in which um, the uh, uh, rocks weather to thick clay, the clay holds the water close to the surface. It keeps uh, drainage from going very deep. It keeps air from going very deep. So it doesn't create good uh, environment for oaks or any other trees. Uh, trees have to be only in some of the deepest ravines where water has uh, disrupted those uh, fields of clay that keep the water close to the surface so that the grass can stay green into May when it's turned brown on the hills just nearby in the same climate. So what do we have in the uh, Great Oaklands, uh, great open spaces of California. We have lots of flowers. But we also have a uh, bunch of grasses. But it turns out that uh, bunch grasses do the best when they're uh, in very high drainage situations. So to restore bunch grasses, they do the best when they're along levee banks where there's a slope where uh, drainage is high. You get Santa Barbara sedge. Uh, unlike a lot of the sedges in the Sierra Nevada, this is one that's uh, in the right place, can be dominant on the valley floor and certainly out on the, in the uh, coastal areas as well. Beautiful big sedge. But the most important uh, big native grass in Central California and also out into what's called the coastal prairie in uh, the Munz classification is creeping wild rye, Elemus triticoides, and it's found widely in the Central Valley. It oftentimes is uh, described as being a, kind of a low wetland plant, but it actually climbs up the hillsides. And the reason that you don't see it more often on the hillsides is that it's like ice cream to cattle. And those hillsides for the most part were grazed. And if the hillsides were grazed, you didn't see creeping wild rye anymore. But when you take the uh, cattle away, it's coming back in big patches in the coast range in areas that uh, where cattle have been removed. And supposedly the story was that if you look along the roadsides, you see stipopulcra bunch grasses. But actually, if you look along the roadsides, you're much more likely to see creeping wild rye than you are uh, stipopulcra. Stipopulcra is maybe uh, one hundredth as common in the Central Valley as uh, Elemus triticoides creeping wild rye. But we also have a lot of those same flowers that uh, John Beer described, like uh, Trifolium variegatum, uh, Trifoceria uh, ariantha, beautiful plant close up, moved from the old uh, Scrofulariaceae into the new Orobankaceae family. We have uh, Limnanthes, which is in uh, its own small family, very 
much associated with seasonal areas that uh, collect a little bit of moisture. Very much uh, a family of California, much more abundant here than anywhere else in the world. And then we have our gold fields, Lacinia californica, Lacinia grassless. Um, and these had to be some of the plants that uh, Mira described as going on for miles. Because you, if you get to the right place, you can still see that in open areas in many parts of California. Here they are close up, along with uh, Hillary, which is not native, but arrived in California very, very early. Ajibothri stipitatus, Hemsichia intermedia. This is a plant that can, uh, even though it's a native, it can uh, withstand disturbance uh, a lot more than most of the native plants. So it's actually become a weed in uh, places with similar climates like Australia. Uh, many, many different species of lupins like Lupinus bicolor here. And of course our state flower, uh, Schultzia California, the California poppy, one of the most spectacular uh, plants in, uh, in the world. And we have some that are not so familiar. Agosphorus heterophylla. Uh, Leia uh, chrysanthemoides. Leia in particular is uh, associated with the valley floras of California. And because valley floras are areas that tend to be farmed and uh, built upon with uh, urbanization, it's uh, the whole genus is uh, getting more and more scarce. And here's one, Contra Costa gold fields, not the same as the common gold fields, but this is one that is a rare plant, virtually extinct in the county it's named after in Contra Costa County, but we have a few nice populations like this up in Solano County. It's still very fragile, very rare. And then as spring proceeds, we have this uh, plant that comes with the common aim of Farewell to spring, Clarkeomena, because it's one of the last of the spring flowers to bloom. And then another plant in that's very spectacular in that Horobanchaceae family is Astelea exerta. Used to be, and it still is really known as uh, purple owl's clover, a very spectacular and still fortunately very common plant in the open areas of California. And we get patterns where different uh, plants come together, color patterns that are spectacular. These are undoubtedly some of the patterns that uh, Muir saw and described when he talked about the beer, uh, bee pastures that went on for miles in the Central Valley. Here we have purple and yellow. That yellow is uh, Waithia angustifolia. And it's one that also kind of fits that ecological picture that Clements painted of uh, Stipopulchra because you find it here and there in the, wherever the Central Valley floor isn't too highly disturbed, just as little bunches like this, along roadsides, and even sometimes covering whole hillsides. Another one that is really widespread uh, around uh, the uh, central part of California in open areas, Tritelia laxa, ethereal spear. This is down in Solano County. Here's a similar field in Sacramento County. And an even larger field down in Contra Costa County. A little bit of white angustifolia here at the edge. So these patterns of flowers that uh, Muir saw are still around with Limnanthes and Trifusaria. You still find the things that uh, Muir saw if you look closely. And even surprisingly enough, in a good year, you can see flowers covering the Central Valley as far as you can see. 
this is Alea glandulosa on the floor of the San Joaquin Valley in Kern County, extending for miles just as the way John Muir described the San Joaquin Valley in 1868. So it's not all gone. And here's uh, Monolopia lanceolata, another spectacular plant. But the story was that all those areas with the flowers, that flowers that Muir saw, the flowers that you can still see today, were only there because uh, cattle had destroyed the bunch grasses in a huge period of overgrazing. And that uh, Muir got there too late to see the valley covered with uh, bunch grasses. So all he could see were the things that replaced it, all these flowers. Well, that story held up for a while, but uh, it was really more deconstructed uh, by Richard Minnick of UC Riverside by anyone else, because he was the first one that uh, was able to go into the Spanish records of the earliest Spanish explorers that got into the Central Valley and see what they saw. Uh, and nobody had read, no, no ecologist had actually ever read these, as far as I know until Richard Minnick did. And he saw that these early explorers found the very same things, fields of wildflowers that went for miles and miles in all directions in their, uh, by their earliest explorers. They didn't describe bunch grasses that the cows destroyed. They found the same kind of uh, wildflowers that Muir described. And if you go to the right place, you can still see today. The grazing is important. For example, in this grazed field, you can see a population of limnanthes. Across the fence where there isn't grazing, you can see a wild radish, a non-native, much taller, and much more competitive plant. So some of these uh, areas that aren't grazed actually crowd out the natives because they're so aggressive and they're uh, from an area where disturbance has gone on for a long time, the Mediterranean basin. So they're very used to disturbance. So uh, in some cases, grazing can be hugely important for preserving our uh, native wildflowers. At the Jepson Prairie Preserve, which uh, when the UC Davis first took it over as one of the earliest uh, University of California preserves, uh, we lost some of the native flowers because we uh, took the uh, limited grazing of uh, horses off and without that, uh, non-natives uh, tended to crowd out the natives. We lost uh, a wonderful little uh, uh, plant in the Polygonaceae that, that you can't find there today any longer. So the Nature Conservancy, when it took over, brought in sheep, and the sheep have been very successful at uh, encouraging natives like these gold fields. Same thing in uh, other Coast Range valleys. You can find beautiful fields dominated by flowers, just like John Muir described, and they're often associated with the cattle. But those cattle are taking the ecological place of what was here before the cattle, and that was tule elk. Tule elk ecologically are somewhat similar to cattle. They're, they're grazers on low vegetation and open areas primarily. And uh, when they were largely close to exterminated, in the uh, early 20th century, cattle replaced them, but now fortunately they're starting to make a comeback. And you have whole herds of them now in uh, some of those areas like the Carissa Plains where the best displays of great fields of wildflowers still occur, and so do tule elk. And it wasn't just tule elk, it was pronghorns as well. And pronghorns are, are gradually coming back to California as well. They were in the, that great open area that had very few inhabitants that you were described in the uh, San Joaquin Valley. They were disappeared when it became a intensive farming area. And now some of the areas around the edges of the Central Valley are uh, seeing pronghorn being reintroduced. And those open areas where grazing keeps the vegetation low, are the most ideal habitats for growing owls. They don't do well in hills, uh, pretty much like flat areas. They like areas where there are uh, very low vegetation so they can see potential predators. 
and they like areas where there are lots of uh, ground squirrels to make burrows and mounds that they can use. Uh, and they're in a very symbiotic relationship with those kinds of rodents, which are uh, part of the endemic uh, mammal vegetation of California. So grazing is a very important uh, part of California. And we have a California Rangeland Coalition, Conservation Coalition, that is very important in protecting natural landscapes in California. They use them to graze their cattle, but they also are very careful to keep the natural values alive. And you can see here that that's working pretty well. We have some of these cattle ranches that are already doing what 3030 was talking about, 30% 30 of nature preserved by the year 2030. Well, they're preserving it already through the California Rangeland Coalition, where you've got oak forests and you've got the same kinds of flower fields that John Muir described and cattle replacing the tule elk as their commercial crop. So here's a map of conservation easements and reserves that the California Rangeland Coalition has established all around the edge and in some cases even in the middle of the California Central Valley. And California Central Valley is, is really a, an important feature. It's one of the largest enclosed flat valleys on earth. It's one you can see from satellites, probably even see if you have a good telescope even from the moon because uh, the idea of a, a flat valley surrounded by hills with just a very narrow opening is uh, almost unique on the earth. So we have something very special here in the Central Valley that we need to look at very closely and protect. Well, as the uh, climate diagram moves into summer and the uh, uh, water is becomes more stressed, you still get plants and you get some new ones that are needed like Croton Cetigerus here, turkey melon. See from the hillsides, this is no longer a green hillside. It's uh, pretty much turned brown. And unlike May, you don't see any green hillsides around. All the grass is turned brown. But you still see beautiful flowers like Areophyllum planatum, woolly sunflower, uh, Enstemon heterophyllus, in among the primarily non native uh, introduced grasses. But we have uh, fields that are covered with uh, natives, even in this uh, as the uh, water becomes scarcer and harder to for the plants to extract. Certain ones uh, actually thrive on this because it reduces competition, like Calicortus luteus here, the old nuggets. And here's one that uh, you don't see too often as um, covering a field, Sedelsia uh, hartwigii. Media elegans, big tall plant that uh, occurs in the uh, valley and in a few areas that are not fully turned into agriculture. And we are, we're very familiar with all the annual lupins that appear several species in the springtime, but here's one that appears in early summer and it's perennial, Lupinus formosus, in the at the edge of the Central Valley. A beautiful lupin that appears when all the grass is, it's non-native, is already brown and dry. Well, among the uh, plants that appear last among the natives uh, is a group of uh, plants in the sunflower family uh, called the Medini. And uh, they're particularly important uh, in the last native plants to flower in the season towards uh, late summer and early fall. It's interesting, this Medeany has a very different relative in the Hawaiian Islands. The Medeany also uh, include the silver storks that are found on the volcano tops on, uh, on Maui, for example. Same, uh, same group within the sunflower family, but here they provide our last flowering plants as the summer becomes uh, hotter and hotter and drier and drier. So there's not been a lot of uh, attention paid to these because this is the time when botanists tend to 
it's the head of the sun, but uh, plenty hot. And this is Hemazonia congesta congesta. And here is a close relative of Hemazonia congesta, congesta lesulifolia with white flowers. And this is one of those rare places in the midst of the Central Valley where you have lots and lots of native uh, flowers on the floor of the Central Valley. In this case, congesta, congesta is yellow, it's yellow flowers. Congesta lesulifolia has white flowers. And here they are, looking like stars in a field in midsummer. But as you get into um, soils that are influenced by alkali that uh, flows uh, in streams out of the coast range where marine sediments dominate, uh, it, at the very uh, deepest part of the valley, before you get into the marshes, the, the uh, alkaline salts, uh, come out of the uh, streams and form alkaline soils. And this is a perfect habitat uh, for Centromedia fungens, also called spikeweed. Very, very spiky plant and it loves alkaline soil. Well, even though this is technically part of the Central Valley, it's had significant up, uh, uplift with the same uplift that uh, lifted up the Sierra Nevada as a big fault block. And this creates these spectacular bluffs above the American River. And on these bluffs is one of the uh, Medeani that ordinarily is most abundant up in the foot, Syrian foothills. But here's a nice population. Uh, it's called Media Cypriodora because it has a smell like citrus and a nice population on those bluffs above the American River. But more than anything else, the Medeani species that's most significant at the end of summer is Holocarpa virgata. As things started to get cold in the Yosemite Valley, uh, Muir took the same walk back across the uh, San Joaquin Valley, but he found very different flowers blooming. And it's pretty clear from that description that what he mostly saw blooming was Holocarpa virgata, bright yellow flowers. Beautiful when it's in mass, even beautiful close up. Here's a landscape in Napa County with Holocarpa Brigada. Here's one on the very floor of the Central Valley with uh, Holocarpa Brigada extending across this field uh, for over a mile to a riparian forest as far as you can see. Uh, it's not true that everything in the Central Valley has been plowed up and farmed. You can still see some really nice na native vegetation here. You know where to look. And here is that same plant extending up into the Sierra foothills uh, in open areas. And here we go, a complete transect dominated by the same species all the way across the Central Valley from the uh, coast range through the floor of the Central Valley and up into the Sierra foothills. Well, you think this might be a pretty important part of California vegetation. You might think that it might get noticed as a, a component of vegetation. But maybe because of that rule that uh, annuals aren't vegetation, and this is a late summer annual, maybe it just gets ignored. And sure enough, trust your vegetation in California, it's not mentioned at all. Totally left out of the book. To read about Holocarpa Brigada, you can read about it, but you have to read about it in Weeds of California that'll tell you how to kill it even though this is the plant more than type of poker that really looks like the plant that at least in the later part of the year is the one that is the real native that dominated the Central Valley. Well, I think it's pretty clear that in spite of what Clement says, there are annuals that make up an important part of the vegetation in California, like the California poppies here, Monolopia lanceolata that covers the landscape. That's not vegetation. I don't know what vegetation can be. Cecilia ciliata, which is what I have in the background of my picture there. 
and this is discussed now. California uh, Native Plant Society has produced a second edition of their Manual of California Vegetation, and they do deal with things like annuals. And there are descriptions of those kind of vegetation. So vegetation is treated along with many other types. And it appreciates how complex vegetation can be in California. We're here on the Great Valley Formation. You get uh, blue oaks and uh, grass. Across to the other slope, the serpentine, you get uh, gray pines and leather oaks, and completely different vegetation, all within the same climate. And here you get uh, on the Sonoma Volcanics, you get oak woodland. On the floor of the valley, you get uh, predominantly uh, non-native annuals, but uh, this is the area that formerly was covered with uh, wildflowers, it's pretty clear, and you still find patches of them. And then if you go further up, you get into that Eocene sediments where the clay is so thick that the trees can no longer grow, but it's no longer brown at the same time of year, it's still green in May. And you get the same thing at the uh, foothills of the Sierra Nevada. On the uh, valley floor, you get uh, valley soils supporting open vegetation dominated by annuals. And then as soon as you get up into uh, rocks where there's uh, much faster drainage, you move into chaparral. It's again, based on a soil change not a climate change. You get something similar here as you go from uh, hills with clay soils down to riparian vegetation in which the riparian erosion have uh, moved the clay along so you have a much coarser soil that can support trees. Whereas when you get up into the clay and the hillsides, no more trees, but beautiful displays of the thorough sphere. So we have a couple of environmental gradients here. We have a environmental gradient that uh, determines the vegetation here in California. The environmental gradient, gradient here is within the same climate, but as you go from rapid drainage, lots of uh, steep slopes and cracks in the rocks beneath the surface, you get chaparral with the highest drainage. The lowest drainage, you get uh, domination by herbs because the water stays close to the surface, air doesn't move uh, into depths of the soil. And then intermediately you get oak woodland, which oftentimes has the same kind of understory as you have out here in the open areas, but uh, better, better drainage than chaparral typically, but not such good drainage as out here in the open areas. Well, that's the uh, environmental gradient in space. You also get an environmental gradient in time from the spring flowers. This is the time when uh, Muir walked across the San Joaquin Valley and described the fields of flowers that went on for miles. And th that's also the time when you have those great fields of the Thurial Spear, Tritelia laxa. And this is misspelled, but it's Lupinus formosus. The early, early summer flowers that are typical perennials that's start blooming when the grass turns brown. And then at the end of summer, when it's maximally dry and hot, uh, and it's uh, even moving into fall, that's when you get Holocarpa brigada. So this is a uh, environmental gradient that actually goes uh, through time from spring to summer to fall. And the weeds reflect this too. The earliest dominant weeds are the annual grasses. Then later on, you get larger weeds that aren't uh, quite so thoroughly dominant, but still are very important, like yellow star thistle. So what do you call these open areas? They've been called grassland, moorland, steppe, prairie. And prairie has a lot of different things associated with it. Coastal prairie, the Palouse prairie, that's the one that was in that uh, area that wasn't in the gerrymandered uh, Nebraska area in Central California, it was called Valley Grassland. This was the area along the coast, but it has the same uh, dominant native plants 
and native uh, grasses as valley grassland. Blues prairie, which is in Eastern Oregon, short grass prairie that's in uh, the central United States. You go further east and the rainfall gets greater, changes into tall grass prairie. I showed you pictures of both of those. And we have uh, animals associated with prairies, prairie dogs, prairie falcons, which I showed you earlier, and even little house on the prairie. So that's a pretty important name in uh, not only culture and vegetation, but also in American history. Well, I like the name California Prairie for both the coastal prairie and what's called valley grassland. And it turns out that was the actual name that was given historically for open areas in California. It was recognized as an important ecosystem. It was only later on uh, when uh, it was uh, changed into uh, a non-native annual grassland that that name kind of went away. But in Dr. Shelford's Ecology of North America it was considered very important. And he called it California Prairie as something unique. One of the great monographs of open areas in California was California Rangeland by Bircham. He also, for a couple of four months, referred to it specifically as California Prairie. So that's what I like to call it. But if you look at uh, conservation plans for which uh, a lot of uh, uh, planning agencies have, you can find ag areas uh, conserved as part of their conservation plans, marshes preserved, vernal pools preserved, riparian forest preserved, oak woodlands preserved. But boy, if you get into those areas that Muir described, that's just non-native annual grassland. And that's the one part of the conservation plan that has no conservation at a value at all. And that's that means it's a free fire zone for any kind of urbanization that occurs. And that's oftentimes exactly what's happened to the remnants of the uh, California prairie that still has the native species that Muir described back in 1868 like Lynn Nancy's here. And uh, Critelia laxa. And Vanilopia lanceolata. I'd say looking at a, uh, a landscape like this, it's a little bit more than just non-native annual grassland, a fit place to plow up or build your next shopping center. Kind of an important landscape and it's not as much of it around as when John Muir described it, but it's still out there and it still needs protection more than ever right now. So to give you an idea of some of the uh, effects of uh, development and what we have here, in the fifth edition inventory that CNPS uh, created, uh, the prairie species on the list, well, it wasn't the most uh, abundant among rare plants. It was it was uh, the fourth largest prairie habitat was the fourth largest among all the species on all the lists. But if we went into the rarer plants, it moved up to third with 157 species. But if you look at the plants that have gone extinct, it's the area with the most extinction of any part of California. 10 species are extinct that occurred in the prairies and uh, no other uh, major habitat in California has had such a great amount of extinction. And I think you can see why. If you have something that is devalued, misdescribed, and a free fire zone for urbanization and intensive farmland, naturally you're gonna get some extinction. Well, if you look at the uh, diversity of California's native prairie species, the upland obligates, these are the ones that are in uh, upland prairie, 95 species but 563 facultative, meaning that they extend from upland prairie into the understory and oak woodland. So a lot of those, 563 species. Actually more obligate upland uh, prairie species than 
obligate vernal pool species. We get a lot of attention to vernal pools, but only 66 obligate vernal pool species, 95 obligate upland prairie species, 58 facultative vernal pool species, because they are pretty much confined just to vernal pools. Sometimes they get into the, the uplands around them. 20 obligate alkaline prairie species, and then 44 facultative alkaline prairie species. The largest obligate upland prairie families are 30 species Asteraceae, and that includes that uh, Bidini group that has those uh, plants like Olocarpha virgata that come in uh, primarily in the later part of the summer. Next, Zorobankaceae, things like Trifaceria eriantha and uh, Castilea exerta, the olive clovers. And then the next, the third largest are the Boraginaceae, uh, which include now a lot of the plants that were formerly in uh, a waterly family, but includes things like the Phacelias. And the largest faculty of our prairie families are somewhat different. Still Asteraceae is at the top, but now second is the legume family because an awful lot of legumes can are not only in the uh, open prairie, but they also extend as understory up into the oak woodland. And third is once again, Paraginaceae. Largest obligate vernal pool families are once again, Asteraceae, the sunflower family. But uh, second in this case are the grasses because there are a lot of specialized grasses in vernal pools uh, like Tectoria, Orcutia, things like that. And then the third most important is Campanulaceae with the down inches. And there's that Medeani subtribe of Asteraceae, the ones that uh, come in in the uh, latter part of the summer like Polocarpa brigada. 20 of those are obligate prairie species and 36 are facultative prairie species. So a, a big chunk of the Medeani are primarily associated with this uh, prairie, California prairie ecosystem, the upland part of it. Not so much uh, those specialized areas like vernal pools. And then there's a new family, somewhat new that's been split out of Liliaceae. This includes the Brodias and the ethereal spheres. 67% of these are obligate or facultative prairie species. Obligate means upland prairies. So out of uh, California's 5,262 total native species, 855 are California prairie species. That means 16% of our total native species are prairie species. Uh, pretty significant chunk of our native species are associated with our prairie ecosystem. Well, what's being done to preserve prairies? Here's a big tract in eastern Sacramento County, one of the most urbanized counties in California, and yet here's an area that's not been urbanized at all yet. Here's a uh, place that uh, got a little bit more protection because I found California's only endemic plant species, Orcutia visita. It's only in Sacramento County. It's remarkable that there's any kind of endemic species in that county because it has the smallest elevation gain of any of California's counties. There's actually more elevation gain in the tiny county of San Francisco than there is in all of Sacramento County. But that's enough uh, to produce one endemic species that's only in this flat little county. Well, this area was set aside as a huge housing project, but fortunately, it's never been built yet. We hope it never gets built because these are the kind of vernal pools with that Orcutia visita, that rare Sacramento only grass is found. And if you get in the background, you can be in uh, valleys in this Cordova Hills area, even though it's in that densely urbanized Sacramento County, it, uh, it has valleys where you can't see a building as far as you can see. It's pretty much a de facto wilderness. Well, here's an area called the Bear Creek Unit. It was a, a private uh, ranch, cattle ranch. And uh, the Bureau of Land Management had uh, the opportunity 
to add it to uh, Bureau of Land Management uh, lands that they manage. But there were some people that said, oh, BLM should never take it because it was so totally overgrazed. It was one of the most overgrazed places in California because they had so many cattle here and they knocked the uh, cattle feed, the grasses right down to the roots. Well, once it became part of uh, the BLM, the BLM uh, acquired it anyway. Ellen Dean did a uh, careful botanical survey and she found a, a plant there, uh, California macrophyllum, that what used to be common in uh, California prairies, but is now very uncommon. And it looks like the reason it survived there is because uh, the cattle with their overgrazing knocked down competition from non-native uh, annual grasses so it could find a, find a place to live. It just got a little uh, rainfall in that uh, open area that the cattle had created. Formerly Tule Oak undoubtedly created it. Very widespread, but uh, a plant that's extremely hard to find today. And it's on that Bear Creek unit. Well, that area that uh, uh, in the Bear Creek unit and uh, that part of uh, the uh, BLM through uh, a lot of lobbying and activism, we were able in 2015 to have the Secretary of the Interior come out and make a new national monument, Berryessa Snow Mountain National Monument, to protect the wonderful habitat that is uh, present in those areas, including a lot of uh, prairie, a lot of chaparral, a lot of oak woodland, uh, huge serpentine deposits, a wonderful natural area, not that far from uh, the metropolitan areas of Sacramento and uh, San Diego, or excuse me, San Francisco, easily accessible from there, uh, but uh, it's finally starting to get some attention as a wonderful natural area. But the latest thing that happened was that one of the most important areas that was left out, Walker Ridge, has now been introduced in Congress as a uh, new part of the National Monument. And here's the team that put it together. Uh, Nick Jensen from California Native Plant Society, yours truly, and a bunch of other fine people, Bob Schneider, uh, Sandy, uh, and uh, Brian Henson, uh, Pam uh, uh, Kurt, and so on and so on. Great bunch of people. Made it happen. Well, another place where we made it happen was uh, an area of alkaline soils that were right at the edge of the city of Woodland, an area that was marked off as uh, a uh, regional park, and yet it uh, was scheduled to be developed into a shopping mall. Well, we found that uh, it had been left behind on these alkaline soils, and it had uh, one of California's rarest plants, uh, Chloropyron palmatum, uh, palmate directed bird's beak. And it was a nice population of that. And that helped us get that area set aside as one of the newest parks and preserves in California. It's now called Woodland Regional Park and Preserve. Also has a, an uncommon legume here, Stragulus tenor tenor. And it's become a real uh, natural uh, love of the people of Woodland. Here's 85 people from the city of Woodland, all volunteers that came out to uh, help uh, food uh, increase access to the Woodland Regional Park. It's loved by the people of Woodland and Woodland's moved in. No longer do they want to make it a shopping mall. Now they really cherish it as a park and preserve that not only has environmental education, but it has a safe place for some of California's rarest plants. Well, Yolo County Grasslands is another regional park, not associated with woodland, but it also, it turns out, has some extremely rare species in it. It has um, uh, uh, Orcadia uh, mucrinata, very rare grass called Solano grass, only in a very few uh, vernal pools. Uh, Calusa grass that formerly was up in 
the rice fields of Palusa County. Not much of it there, if any, but it survives here in this regional park. And a uh, vernal pool fairy shrimp uh, and uh, vernal pool tadpole shrimp also survive there. And it's particularly the tadpole shrimp is a federally listed endangered species. But that was all ignored by when the county of Yolo decided to industrialize it and cover that habitat for those rare species with uh, solar farms and destroy the habitat. Well, fortunately, we were able to, at least we, we couldn't take these out, but we were able to stop them before they took all of the habitat for those rare species. So uh, now we not only, because of legal action, stopped the uh, infrastructure that was going in and destroying the rare species, but we were also able to help design a trail system that uh, led to people where they could learn about the species, but not uh, damage them at all. So that we've got very good protection now for the ones that are still around. Well, another important victory recently was uh, Tesla in uh, the uh, Coast Range, south of San Francisco Bay. It's one of those areas that has a mosaic here of oak woodland, chaparral, two different kinds of prairie, one on the hillside, one down a kind of riparian prairie with uh, a California poppy down here by the stream, a wonderful botanically rich area that was scheduled originally to be uh, a playground for off-road vehicles, which would quickly destroy uh, the vegetation integrity that you see is, is so beautiful here. So it's located here on the border between San Joaquin County and Alameda County and particularly the people from the East Bay chapter and a lot of other people got together and they protected it from the vehicle recreation area expanding, taking in all this wonderful rich habitat at Tesla Park. And here's a close up of Tesla Park showing all these different kinds of habitat, blue oak woodland, California annual grassland, which would be California prairie, uh, and so on and so on. Chaparral is there as well. Great. Uh, Great uh, plant habitat for the first time now with good protection. Well, the most important area that probably protects uh, the best example of uh, California prairie is Carriza Plain National Monument. A place I learned about when I was a Cal Poly student, and then later on I worked for the uh, Nature Conservancy and they were interested in important places to preserve. They bought it and later on turned it over to the federal government, which created Carriza Plain National Monument. So we have finally some of the most wonderful California prairie in the world protected here at Carriza Plain National Monument. Here's the edge of it. Here we see the, the wonderful fields, kind of like John Muir described, going on and on for miles, poppies, lupins, Beautiful picture, and it was appreciated so much that that was the picture they chose for the cover of the new Jepson Manual Vascular Plants of California. Fields and fields of Monolopia lanceolata, as far as you can see. Beautiful plant close up with some fiddle necks. Cilia ciliata. Here's a, here's a strange beauty of the mustard family, Colanthus inflatus that uh, extends up the intercoast range from the Mojave Desert and has a nice population in Carriza Plains, along with a lot of other diversity, like a different facility here, uh, fiddle necks. And here's a field of different fiddle necks, not the common fiddle neck. This is uh, Amsinchia tessellata. And you can see it covers the hillsides here in Carriza Plains. And this is, uh, one of the medias, that, that important genus on the valley floors. Um, this is uh, one of the uh, medias that is uh, covering parts of trees of plain. So when those colors, flower colors come together, you get a beautiful landscape here. Well, Teon Ranch is another one that uh, 
It's been a very important project of uh, Nick Jensen and California Native Plant Society to save as much of it as was possible. And they saved, were able to save a lot of it, it looks like. It's an amazing place. Here's the boundary of Tejon Ranch, one of these old gigantic cattle ranches in California that was uh, about to be turned into uh, an urban residential area. But it includes the Great Central Valley, the Sierra Nevada, Mojave Desert, and the South Coast Range, Southern California, right here. And lots of California prairie. Beautiful prairie landscape. Well, these prairies are definitely at risk. We saw how they could be at risk from too many solar farms in the wrong place, uh, vineyards that uh, aren't so dependent on flat areas for irrigation have moved into lots of California prairies. And then urbanization is always a threat. As urbanization spreads, it spreads too often into areas that are often just treated as uh, non-native annual grassland that are really the key to protecting California's prairie landscapes that are so much a threat. So if you look at the uh, boundary of California Prairie that was, uh, and that's exactly what they call it, California Prairie, in Bircham's uh, monograph, you see it running up and down the Central Valley primarily with some large areas on the coast. These would be what was called coastal prairie, but has many of the same dominant species as a Korean land and a little bit in Southern California as well. Well, in 2003, uh, there was a similar map of California's prairie grasslands, and more of it was protected than you might think, primarily on cattle ranches, the biggest concentration down here in the Carissa Plain area in the Southern Coast Range. But other parts, in very many places in California, even up here by the Oregon border, a few little spots here and there, even in Southern California. So it's here just needs to be protected to survive. You can find it if you look for it, but you have to appreciate it. First time I saw this picture, it was shown at a uh, lecture by a uh, botany professor from UCLA that came to UC Davis. And he said, this is a, it may look nice, but it's a ruined landscape because all the, the uh, stipe of pulchra bunch grass that should be covering it is gone and it's covered up with, uh, it's being taken over by all these annuals that are unimportant. Well, some people appreciate more than that professor did what we have here in California. Bob Gibbons wrote a book about the 50 best wildflower sites in the entire world. And for the uh, first page you open up, to the 50 greatest wildflower sites in the entire world is this picture from the edge of Carrizo Plains with Pencilia pectinata in the foreground. And I liked it so much that when uh, I edited it back in 2011, California's Prairie and Grassland special issue of Fremontia, I took that same picture with a little different uh, coloration and put it on the cover and you can probably still get that from California Native Plants Society if we still have a, a few copies left. So the message here is for people like little Jacob here, let's keep California prairie around. So next generation can see what we're able to see and what John Muir was able to see many, many years ago. But it's still around and still protected and still lovely and beautiful like little Jacob is, is seeing it right here in this picture. Thank you very much. Glenn, that was both beautiful and eye-opening. Uh, I'll never drive across the Central Valley with the same set of eyes again. I, I'm, you know, I think, think we'll all be in a, in a state of heightened expectation of seeing something that we previously didn't realize was there. And uh, thanks so much. Oh, there are there are some questions in the uh, in the chat and comments, uh, and I'll go through those and hopefully we'll have it 
some time for uh, in-person questions. Uh, uh, I'd encourage you to use the raised hand feature because I can't see everybody. There's a comment from Allison says, actually blue wild rye is not very palatable to grazing animals like cows. Grazing, and you mentioned grazing is essential to maintaining California grasslands. Were you talking about blue wild rye? No, I wasn't. Uh, Creepy oh. wild rye is a different species than blue wild rye. That's what I thought. Uh, Roxanne asks, what management practices are essential for substituting domestic animals, domesticated animals for native elk, deer, and antelope? Well, it, uh, it's kind of an art more than anything. Sometimes it's, uh, I think that uh, you have many different uh, kinds of California prairie with different climates, different soils. And uh, I think uh, some of the best results are people just kind of experimenting what works best, what brings the uh, native uh, plants to the greatest uh, abundance. And uh, we've seen examples like uh, there, one of the uh, areas that I uh, do trips every spring to is Fair Valley, uh, just east of Walker Ridge. And uh, that's actually improved with uh, a good grazing regime. But I don't think there's ever been a, a, a specific textbook with all the steps that you have to take. A lot of it is just a learning your landscape and becoming appreciative of it and treating it like an art and seeing what works the best. But grazing is one thing. Sometimes it's fire. You can have uh, different levels of grazing. One of the biggest dangers is too much fertilization because uh, the uh, Native plants are uh, adapted to uh, low nitrogen levels. Uh, higher nitrogen levels uh, oftentimes favor the uh, very aggressive non-native plants. We even had a, a situation at uh, a park uh, in the Bay Area in San Mateo County that uh, where the traffic along the freeway dropped enough nitrogen to uh, do some damage to the uh, native plants that the park was set aside to protect what changes the vegetation just from exhaust gases. And uh, Eva asked, don't you find the flower species composition different in grazed compared to ungrazed grassland? Well, if it actually, if there's no grazing at all, we find that uh, usually the uh, non-native species tend to take over because the most important thing, uh, value of grazing is to uh, lessen the competition with the uh, non-native but more aggressive uh, weeds that come in. And they're not all grasses either. So we get some very bad ones like yellow star thistle as well. So the right amount of grazing to keep these very competitive plants. I showed that one picture where you had native limnantes in an area that was heavily grazed and uh, non-native radish across the fence where, which was ungrazed. That's often the case with uh, no grazing at all. You get complete dominance by non-native plants. And uh, Vernon comments that uh, Hemisonia congesta congesta is white flowered and Hemisonia congesta lutescens is yellow. They can hybridize. Well, the one I showed you with white flowers was Lusulifolia. That's, uh, and I believe at least in the uh, Jepson manual that congesta can, uh, uh, so I looked at the just, just as listed as you're having yellow flowers. So, but I, I no doubt there is hybridization. Out there. They're obviously closely related. Yeah. And Betsy uh, comments that it'd be great to have a list of places we can access. Does does one e exist on the internet of of prairies that would be good to visit, and maybe the season at the time of year when they're best? Well, actually. Uh, my wife Sue has found an excellent wildflower site that tells you what's blooming where all through California. And uh, that uh, that's actually uh, the uh, probably one of the best sources of a place to find flowers when they're blooming because typically, because we have that short uh, window between when uh, the rains fall and it starts to get warmer, oftentimes the best flower displays don't last too long. So it's good to... Yeah. Be at the right place at the right time. Could, could you indicate what that uh, site is and maybe put it in the chat? Just a second. My wife is the one that knows about it. Let me call her and, and uh, she'll tell you. Sue? Sue? We've got a question for you. Okay. Why don't we, 
since we're running short on time, why don't we go on and come yeah. back to that? Uh, Vernon says that Marin's last known population of Lasthenia congestans was probably extirpated by slurrying three years ago near Valley Ford. Well, that's a, a Marin specific comment. Uh, well, there's uh, certainly uh, losses of uh, populations all over the place. And, yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah. What's the uh, what's the name of that uh, wildflower thing that you use to know where the plants are blooming, where they want to? Is a request? Oh, for on uh, Facebook, there's a group called. Uh, I'll I'll tell you in a second. I'll come back. And uh, Kristen says, Cal Fire plans to burn grassland on the San Francisco Peninsula to remove coyote shrub. They claim coyote is invasive, but is grown naturally. What do you think of burning na native grasslands? Well, it's another way to uh, remove that competition from uh, non-natives. And uh, it's uh, probably a little more difficult to manage and it doesn't have an immediate uh, economic advantage that grazing does, but it's still uh, very important. I remember I was, uh, I learned this many, many years ago on the Palos Verdes Peninsula, where you never saw Calicordus catalinii, a beautiful uh, silver Calicordus. And I found it on a vacant lot covered with this wonderful Calicordus, which was nowhere else to be seen because that, the grass had been burned on this vacant lot. So yeah, that's another thing that will reduce the competition from non-natives and can be very, very helpful for natives. So burning is produces some of the same effects that uh, grazing does. And Maribeth uh, asks, what would be a good place to see flowering prairie now? Well, once a, uh, it's called the California Wildflower Report. It's on Facebook. That's it's a the name public it. group. And it's a public group. They're reporting all over California right now. Yeah. So we're getting things from Southern California, the desert. Coyote uh, Hills. Yeah. Yeah. So that's definitely uh, uh, the way California Wildflower Report. Right. California Wildflower right. Report. Okay. And Yvonne asks, did Muir literally mean native bees were the major pollinator of those miles of native flowers? Well, I don't know that he uh, uh, did uh, taxonomy you know, of the bees, but of course, uh, at that time, <laughs> they probably were native bees because uh, without the uh, agriculture that introduced uh, honeybees, they probably would have been native bees. And native bees are really uh, a major feature of California. We have one of the world's highest air, uh, bee, native bee diversity. So they're incredibly important. I've, I've seen populations that otherwise weren't disturbed die out because their uh, pollinators were uh, wiped out in the area. So it's very important to, uh, one of the things that sometimes happen is people will preserve vernal pools, but the uh, native bees nest in the upland California prairie. And if you say, just save the vernal pool and don't serve the, save the uplands, you may destroy the uh, very population of bees that the vernal pool flowers depend on. So yeah, that's uh, an important issue. And one of the other things that's happening is that uh, we're getting uh, bees that are lost, being lost even in areas that are not being disturbed. One of the uh, rarest and on the verge of extinction is Franklin's bumblebee, which is an endemic bee of the Klamath Mountains, which have had very little urbanization or habitat change. And it's quite possible that it's been uh, infected with uh, some of the parasites the honeybees uh, have brought over to North America. Yeah. And we're having a general decline in uh, bumblebees in the Central Valley. Clint asked, do you have any feeling about the effect of carbon farming on native grassland in which mulch or compost is added to grassland to enhance the amount of carbon stored in the soil? Well, I think that's not compatible with uh, uh, native species because that's uh, quite different from what uh, the uh, uh, natural uh, California prairie was uh, designed to uh, experience. So. Uh, you, you can get a certain amount of carbon added by uh, a cattle, but this would be even more intense urbanization. So uh, uh, adding of uh, carbon. So it probably would tend to favor the non-natives over the natives. So it, it, if you want to do it as a 
carbon feature. It's a little bit like covering your grassland with uh, solar farms. It may have be good for that, but uh, it's probably not good for uh, preserving native prairie at all. And there's several other comments. Uh, Yvonne says, there's an area of coastal prairie at Point Malati along the Richmond shoreline that folks are trying hard to save. And Paul says, the last chapter of Muir's The Mountains of California has some information on the bees he saw. So that's, that's the, uh, the chat. I don't see any questions. I don't see any raised hands. Uh, Malati, by the way, is a... Uh... A wonderful example of uh, a little bit of intact uh, native prairie that's well worth preserving and it has for example uh, it has red fescue native red fescue there and uh, it's uh, it's a wonderful little area and because of it's uh, on the east side of the bay right across from the golden gate it has a much moister cooler climate than virtually anywhere else in the coast range which is one reason you can even get redwood uh, groves in the Oakland Hills. Yeah. So uh, it's a it's a really uh, amazing little place. If you call any place a coastal prairie, that would definitely qualify. Yeah. Well, again, Glenn, thank you so much for a very fine, informative talk. Uh, I just before we leave, I just want to let you know what next month's program will be, which is again the second Monday, the eleventh of of April. Uh, Patrick Reynolds is going to be talking about maximizing the habitat value in urban landscapes. So we'll be talking about native horticulture. Uh, he's uh, with the Native Seed and Nursery Program at Heritage Growers, which is in the Sacramento area. And I think uh, you'll find that uh, very informative. So we'll look forward to seeing you next month. Thank Thanks. you again.